Jackie Hassan is your host on this most epic journey through pop culture's past. Hold on to your butts. This is Nostalgia Theater. Brought to you by the Movie Film Podcast. It begins as a quest. You must find the shard. The crystal shard. The crystal shard? To save our world, you bleed. A wonderful fantasy adventure. mystical realm of sights and sounds. Enter the world of the Dark Crystal. What this is all about? Is that it, Gelsman? Now, from directors Jim Henson and Frank Oz and Gary Kurtz, the producer of Star Wars, comes a new dimension of fantasy and adventure. Another world, another time, in the age of wonder. The Dark Crystal. Hi everybody, welcome back to Nostalgia Theater. This is Zaki Hassan, and when we think of the year 1982, it's sort of a bumper crop of memorable sci-fi fantasy movies. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can think of Blade Runner, E.T., The Thing, Tron, Star Trek II, uh, The Secret of Nim. Really, kind of, kind of a memorable year, certainly for me in my childhood. And tucked away in 1982, just at the very tail end, was a little movie called *The Dark Crystal*. And this is directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz, and it was co-produced by Gary Kurtz of *Star Wars* and *The Empire Strikes Back*. And this is a film that uh, certainly, when I saw it, it it uh, hit me at exactly the right age. I was about uh, seven, I think, when I saw it. And it's been interesting to watch the perception of this film change over time where it it was initially perceived as kind of an embarrassing uh, you know childish thing that maybe didn't do as well as it could have and then it's become this very beloved cult artifact and here we are now this is the 30th 35th anniversary excuse me of the dark crystal and uh here to talk to me about the film and its legacy and about his new book is Cassine Gaines he is the author of The Dark Crystal the Ultimate Visual History a lovely new hardcover from Insight Editions which is due out September 19th. Kassin, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Zachy. I'm glad to be on. So, uh, by way of background, Kassin, who has been a previous guest on the Movie Film Podcast, uh, he wrote uh, Inside Pee Wee's Playhouse. He also wrote uh, We Don't Need Roads, the making of the Back to the Future trilogy, which I freaking love that book. So when I heard that you were the guy behind the Dark Crystal book, that made me very, I was very content with that. I was like, all right, he's the guy. He's the guy to do it. (laughs) Thank you. I love hearing that. That's very flattering. So we we definitely want to get into the book and how you how you sort of backed into to writing this. But I think by way of context, you know, what is what is your own experience with the Dark Crystal? I have a feeling you and I are, are kind of roughly the same age. Uh, did is it a movie that you grew up with? It isn't actually, and it's funny because. I've always known about the Dark Crystal, you know, being a kid, growing up, loving um, Labyrinth was a, was a film that I was really familiar with as a kid. Sure. And I remember seeing a 
Jim Henson television special. I think it was on Nickelodeon, even though I don't know if that completely makes sense, but that's maybe it was Disney Channel or something like that. And they were going through, of course, the great Muppet caper and the Muppet show and Sesame Street and Labyrinth. And then when they showed clips from the Dark Crystal, my mind was just sort of blown as a kid. Like I couldn't process how the person who created Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy also created this amazing world that looked kind of dark and scary and and a little bit, you know, weird and unsettling. And, um, you know, I watched a lot of fantasy as a kid, you know, I loved the never ending story and things like that. And, but something about the dark Crystal just seemed so, antithetical to what I knew of Jim Henson, that I was really intrigued by it. And um, as an adult, when I went and and saw The Dark Crystal from start to finish, really for the first time, it was as an adult. And I completely understood. um, I, I, I like to say, you know, you can be a fan of the Muppets and you can be a fan of Jim Henson um, without being a fan of the Dark Crystal, but to really know Jim Henson and really get a sense of who he was as as a filmmaker and as an artist, you, you kind of have to love The Dark Crystal. You know, there's such a um, depth to the film and the filmmaking process that he was going for with The Dark Crystal, and um, it sounds really corny, but I really felt such an amazing responsibility when I was writing this book to get it right, because hmm. I know how much work he put into trying to get this film right. Um, You know, it was a long time coming and it was very expensive and very time consuming. And even in the 11th hour, there were even more trials and tribulations in the post-production process. Um, So I really felt um, more so than on any other book that I've ever written. I really felt like uh, this amazing responsibility to do justice to the story behind this film. Well, maybe you can get into that a little bit, obviously, without giving away the farm, because we do want people to buy the book. But, but I mean, where where did the genesis of this start, and and why was it something that Jim Henson was willing to? I mean, he put his own money into this. He 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 was willing to, you know, risk it all on on this fantasy story. Why this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when when you think of Jim Henson, the very first thing that you think of, of course, is the Muppets, whether it's Sesame Street or or the Muppets, you know, the Kermit and, and Piggy and Gonzo and Fozzie. And, you know, he was very concerned at, at this point in his career in 1976, so significantly before The Dark Crystal was released, yeah. that he was sort of being pegged as the Muppet guy, you know, there isn't too much of this in the book because we sort of streamlined it through the editing process, but, you know, he changed the name of his production company. Um, It used to have Muppets in the name of his production company, and then he changed it to um, the Henson Organization and Henson Associates. And, you know, he was sort of trying to create a little bit of distance between him and the Muppets, not that he wasn't proud of it. And of course he did um, the Muppet show and the Muppet movie and the great Muppet caper, um, in the time that he was working on The Dark Crystal, but he didn't want to be pegged as just that Muppet guy. And um, so for the genesis of The Dark Crystal really started with Jim Henson wanting to tell a darker story. Um, A lot of people sort of forget that back in the inaugural season of Saturday Night Live, Jim Henson had a regular segment called The Land of Gorch, which had these sort of like, uh, kind of like dinosaur monster or hybrid characters. And um, the humor was a little bit adult. Like there, you know, there were these characters that were like, um, you know, kind of hallucinating and, and things like that. It was very much of the time, yeah. I guess I'll say. And, um, and, and so he was sort of experimenting with telling darker stories, um, still using comedy, still using music in some cases. And he was introduced to um, the artwork of Brian Froud, and um, Brian Froud is a, a wonderful artist who um, illustrates these great um, mythological, um, I, I don't want to say just mythological, I mean, they're, they're mythological, but they're also like classical, they're just these beautiful, beautiful very um, ornate. works of art. Yes, and they're, they're also very, um, they're also very of the earth, too, you know, right. they're also very, um, you know, environmental almost in a way, right. even though they're these fantastic characters, and you see some of that uh, bear itself out 
in the Dark Crystal. And so Jim Henson and Brian Froud partnered up to tell this story, and they didn't really know what it was going to be. Um, I can't imagine a film now being you know, created where they just start creating characters and then figuring out the plot. Right. It just seems <laughs> um, like something that would never happen now, but it happened then because Jim Henson wanted it to, and he was in a place in his career where he could convince someone to put up the money <laughs> to, to let him make this film. And so that's really the genesis of it. A nice long answer for you, but that's oh, really it. <laughs> that's, well, and, and I mean, from, from 76 to... 82 i mean what was the what was what was the the i was going to say hold up but i guess i can understand the hold up because the idea of a, a movie like the dark crystal even today is somewhat unprecedented uh, much less back then so i guess my question would be what was the thing that finally got the thing made well i i think part of the issue um i guess the answer to to the, the question that almost happened about the holdup and also about what got it made um, was the double-edged sword yeah. of the Muppet movie. Hmm. You know, um, you know the, the Muppet show was amazingly successful, and then Jim Henson um, was working on the Muppet movie concurrent, and the film was an amazing success. And Jim Henson said, oh, well, great. Now, I, you know, I demonstrated that puppets can work on screen. They can sort of be the centerpiece of a feature film. Now, finally, can, can we do the dark crystal? And he still couldn't get a studio interested in, or get any backers. And um, part of the problem that he had was that people said, well, you've demonstrated that the Muppets work on screen, not that Muppets <laughs> right. work on screen. Right, right. Um, and so ultimately he was able to convince uh, Lou Grade, who was the producer of the Muppet show and also the Muppet movie to um, get him into a two picture deal. So he did the great Muppet caper and the dark crystal, and they were in pre-production um, at the same time for both. That was how Jim Henson ultimately got, got this film funded. And I mean, Lou Grade had obviously, as a, a producer of English television, been involved with the Super Marionation programs of Jerry Anderson, right? Mm, right. So, so there was there was there's a little bit of uh, you know the the connective tissue from from one puppet legacy to another. Yeah, and actually, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Gary Kurtz at this point because yes. one of the other things that was really important was um, a bunch of the. Henson um, puppeteers and creative team and puppet builders went to go work on The Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> including, sure. um, including Frank Oz, you know, most notably. Um, and so as they were working on Yoda, you know, in a weird sort of way, they were learning things that they could then apply to the Dark Crystal. You know, George Lucas, um, I don't know if he realizes that he was partially funding, you know, R&D for the Dark Crystal, but that's kind of what he was doing at that time. Wow. <laughs> So Gary Kurtz, see Gary Kurtz is just a fascinating character to me in the sense that he's you know he he was one of the most instrumental people in those first two Star Wars movies but it almost feels like he's been either by design or just by the passage of time been sort of written out of the legend and yet I can I can point to him as being one of the key figures in in the stuff we point to as the most important stuff in those, in those early star Wars movies. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, you know, I'm a big star Wars fan, but I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, um, the time and place when it comes to creating art. Hmm. And, you know, I, I do a lot of theater and in addition to, to writing, and I, I always tell my creative team and my cast when I go to stage a show that if we came back six months from now and tried to put this show together, it would be a different show because we're all in a different place in our lives. Hmm. And I think that we see what sort of like, you know, George Lucas, is is like without the checks and balance of of a Gary Kurtz working yeah, with him, you know. Right. Um, we, we've seen some of the other projects that George Lucas um, has done, and including obviously the Star Wars prequel series. <laughs> and so, Gary Kurtz was obviously instrumental, and there are a number of things that um, that have sort of gone forgotten, as you said, that in terms of his contributions. And in speaking with Gary Kurtz, he's just. Um, 
You know, there are some people who are real filmmaking artists. You know, there are lots of people that make movies, but he just has such a um, a, a vocabulary and such a um, just such a, a sense, like a like almost like a, a spiritual sense. You know, I don't want to sound like weird about it, but almost yeah. like a spiritual sense for what works on screen and why things work on screen. And it was just great to talk to him. You know, I wanted to talk to him more about Star Wars. I'm (laughs) sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'd, I'd want to pick his brain like uh, deep into the evening about all the various, (laughs) you know, Oh, when, when Yoda did this, was that your, why did you do this? And, you know, smart, you know? Yeah. I well, love and, it. And and I th- and we're going off a little tangent, but I think it, it ties in. I mean, I think as it pertains to Star Wars, I mean, I think uh, what what you're describing about about H- Gary Kurtz's sort of innate sense of story and whatnot. I mean, I think I think that that could just as easily apply to to George Lucas. And I think that therein we see the the rift in that you can really you could really only have had one captain of that ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and and I think it's to the franchise is, is uh, lost, unfortunately, because I, I wish he could have been there to to see Return of the Jedi through to its completion. Yeah, I agree completely. Although now we've come full circle because he didn't do Return of the Jedi. That's right. He did Dark Crystal instead. <laughs> see, I was setting you up. <laughs> that was <right> <laughs> so so, how does Gary Kurtz get involved in the Dark Crystal? So Gary Kurtz gets involved because um, as they were having difficulty with Empire, um, he he had actually met Jim Henson when they were working on the first Star Wars, and Jim Henson was filming The Muppet Show at Elstree Studios. So they had sort wow. of um, casually met each other, and when they were having a difficult time creating uh, Yoda specifically, but some of the creatures for Empire... Um, Gary Kurtz reached out to Jim Henson and asked if, if he would help. And he said, you know, in turn, I know that you're working on this fantasy t- film. You know, if you need any help on that, I'll, I'll help you out. And so they wow. sort of had this gentleman's agreement um, to help each other, even though Jim Henson at the time um, didn't really know if he if he wanted Gary Kurtz's help. You know, he was happy to sort of, <laughs> you know, Jim Henson at the time, and I think this is sort of um, – skirted in the book a little bit, but, you know, there's Jim Henson at the time really um, felt like he was happy to help out with Star Wars because he wanted his, his team to sort of learn more about foam latex and learn oh, more sure. about <laughs> building. And also, um, you know, if you think about Yoda and if you think about, you know, any of the Muppets, the big difference, of course, is that Yoda is a character that's supposed to exist in the, well, the Muppets are supposed to exist in the world, real world as well. But Yoda is a character, sort of, of that planet. Right. Well, I mean, the, the, the Muppets we are. we acknowledge that they're puppets, even while they interact with like Steve Martin or whatever. Right. Exactly. Yep. Right. The the Muppets are are puppets, you know, by design. Even you know, if you watch Sesame Street, like they are they are monsters. You know, they sort of have like this unique distinction as, as being right. separate from um, the human characters. Whereas in the Dark Crystal, um, it's really more about realism and and seeming natural and like these creatures could actually exist. And um, that was something else that was really important. You know, Frank Oz learning about. Um, how to communicate through a puppet to sort of tell that kind, those kinds of stories, um, which was actually a challenge for him initially. You know, he was very used to sort of bopping <laughs> instead of, you know, walking yeah. <laughs> like a Jedi does. Yeah. So, so, I mean, with that in mind, I mean, as, as the dark crystal comes together and, and this is something you get into a little bit in the book, but, but, how how much thought was or how serious was the discussion about not having you know uh, the the Gelflings be be puppets? So I know having our main characters being puppets and relying on the audience to look past the fact that they are puppets versus you know doing what what they did later with Labyrinth, where you, you place human actors, if not human characters, in in this sort of fantastic scenario. Well, there's a quote in the book that I love. I should really commit it to memory because I reference it. <laughs> I reference it all the time. But um, Catherine Mullen, who uh, puppeteered Kira, said that you know all artists want to tell a truth. I'm paraphrasing. All artists want to tell a truth through the medium um, 
that they work best in. And, and for Jim Henson, that medium was puppetry. And, you know, he really wanted to tell this story with all puppets. Um, you know, for him, it, it sort of was like a cheat to put um, human actors in makeup. And the other thing, too, that, that he was really concerned with was that once you put a human in makeup or someone that's like, like you know, like the original Planet of the Apes series, for example, like sure. once you put someone who's notably a, a, noticeably a human in prosthetics or something like that, it, it really um, creates a scale for all of the other creatures that wow. is based on like a human scale. You know, if you, if you kind of follow what I'm saying, I absolutely, um, that's, I never so, would have thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't actually recall how much of that is actually in the book, but that was a big thing for him was that he really didn't want, um, because once, you know, if the the lead characters are six feet tall, then everything else is sort of based on that. And then all of a sudden you're in a world that is, that resembles earth in some way, as opposed to a true fantasy world. And so um, that's why having all puppets was really important. And the, the creatures like the, the Skeksis and the, the mystics, um, you know, they were really the pup, the body puppets were really expanded so that they, they masked the human form underneath so that you didn't have that sort of human scale. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your your conversations with with uh, Frank Oz and um, what his collaboration was like with George Lucas? I know I know um, to some extent you talk about how they 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 had a unique friendship. I think is is the way uh, it's described in the book. Yeah, I I would love to, except I actually didn't speak with Frank Oz. Frank Oz was the Frank Oz actually is. Um, a, a real hero of mine. I love sure. Little Shop of Horrors. It's one of my favorite films. And um, and Frank Oz was uh, incredibly instrumental in terms of the photos in the book and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of schedule, he was the one person that I just had a little bit of a hard time sure. get, syncing up with in terms of schedule. Um, I, I don't know if this is one of the things that you wanted to talk about, but the timeline for writing this book was like insane. Oh, it was really? so, <laughs> It was a very quick um, turnaround from when I was brought on to this project and, um, you know, when, when we wanted to release it in conjunction with the 35th anniversary. And so all of the interviews, um, and I spoke with a, a, a people were very, um, you know, people that, that were able to sort of clear their schedules mm-hmm. for me. Um, that was, that was fantastic. However, I just, we just couldn't work it out timing wise with Frank Oz, unfortunately. Well, you, at the very least, you you you, you did speak with uh, Cheryl Henson, I believe, and she she discussed their uh, the relationship between her father and 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 Frank. Oh yeah, sure. And and the thing that's interesting, I think, is that you know they sort of, uh, as Cheryl describes in the book, they had sort of like a a friendship of like one upsmanship a little right. bit. Right. That, that that stuck out to uh, me. Yeah. There was a little, yeah, there was a little bit of back and forth, and the thing that. Uh, that I love is every single person that I spoke to that was on set for the dark crystal talked about how Frank and Jim would just sort of slip into these character voices. Like when they would start to kind of like (laughs) argue, (laughs) it sounds kind of nutty when you think about it, but like, you know, know, people said they would be in a meeting and they'd start to like disagree. And then Bert and Ernie would come out (laughs) or Kermit and Piggy. Like they'd like slip into these, these personas. Um, And it's, it's, you know, it's, funny because the dark crystal is such a um you know it, it's it's a film that is it doesn't it's not as light as any of the muppet films and it isn't even as light as labyrinth you know labyrinth is is heavy i guess at, at points in different ways and i guess thematically it's very sort of serious you know in terms right. of what it's saying about growing up and, and all of that stuff but um but they had so much fun making the dark crystal and it, and so a lot of people enjoyed watching the Frank and Jim show cuz it, it seems like that was a real show. <laughs> well, and and I love I love reading the exchange and 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 I I can't remember if this is in the book but or or if I got it from somewhere else but where where Jim Henson asks him to co-direct the film and he says why why do you want me to do it and he says because it'll be better. Yeah. And and Yeah, the, that's in the, the book. The it, lack of um, ego there, you know. There's a, there's a lack of ego and also such a, a great awareness, you know, um, 
what really came across to me in interviewing people, and I hope it comes across in the book, is that Jim Henson really only had one objective with The Dark Crystal. And in, in, in talking to people, I think only one objective over the course of his career, which was to surround himself with the best people to tell the best stories he could. And, you know, if that meant sharing a co-directing credit, um, if that meant, you know, bringing production over to London or to Canada, if that meant, um, you know, working on a film for seven years, you know, he was willing to do it in order to, to tell the best story possible. And I have to say, you know, just on a, a personal note, that has really continued with the Jim Henson company today. You know, hmm. there are so many people that have entered um, the orbit, I guess I'll say, of the Jim Henson company. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to, to be included in that group of people. And they really couldn't be more inviting, more encouraging, more supportive, and, and really more um, welcoming of your ideas and your talents and what you bring to the table and a number of people who are working on um, the Netflix Age of Resistance prequel series. And just just as a, a blanket announcement, I know nothing special about it. I just know what I've read online, so sure. <laughs> I'm not spoiling anything. But, um, but, you know, a number of people that are working on the Age of Resistance are people that have um, entered the orbit of the Jim Henson Company, the, some of them just as fans. Um, you know, originally, who have kind of, you know, been brought on board and invited to help expand this world. And um, so it's great. It's great to see there's no ego. Um, there's no ego there. And, and it seems like um, there was no ego on any of these projects that Jim worked on during his lifetime. Did, how did he deal with the reception of the film? Because, I mean, it for, just for looking at the numbers, I mean, the, the general sense I have is it did okay but it wasn't as splashy as, as I'm sure they would have liked. Yeah, and that, that's exactly it. And I think part of the issue was um, the critical response was almost worse than the box office response. And I think that that was really what bothered Jim Henson. Um, you know, and, and again, this is one of those things that um, it's mentioned in the book, but it isn't really dwelled upon. But um, a review that sticks out in my mind, which isn't mentioned in the book, um, I think I think it's from Time magazine. Um, the beginning of it, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is the general sense of it, is um, Jim Henson is a filmmaker, a serious filmmaker, and puppets can be serious, damn it. At least that's what Jim Henson wants you to believe. Hmm. I mean that was that was the beginning of the and I'm I'm paraphrasing but it's, I'm pretty close to what it actually said. So kind of and, condescending uh, a little bit. Yeah, it was it was really condescending and um you know there's there's this quote in the book that that really uh breaks my heart. You know, I remember when Cheryl told me this story where it was late in Jim's life um and they were looking through this this encyclopedia of directors and they were just Hundred, you know, tens of thousands of directors listed in all of their credits. And as he was thumbing through, um, he wasn't listed. And, huh. you know, Cheryl, as Cheryl tells it to me, you know, she says, you know, it sort of sounds like a very petty thing for Jim Henson to be upset that he wasn't listed um, in this encyclopedia of directors. But, you know, he... Um, you know, at, at a point in his career, he really wanted to be an experimental filmmaker. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, but he wanted to be an experimental filmmaker. He had a lot of interest in things beyond the tree. And the Dark Crystal um, and Labyrinth were really sort of opportunities for him to grow as an artist and, and sort of show some of his creativity. And he felt like he never was um, appreciated in that way. You know, people were just sort of content with the Muppets. And, and again, that's not to say anything disparaging about the, the Muppets, but, you know, he wanted his, his sort of legacy to be the Muppets and more. And yeah. at least during his lifetime, um, he never got to see sort of the cult following of the Dark Crystal or Labyrinth. And I think he would just be, uh, you know, amazed um, to see, you know, there's a, there's a Dark Crystal board game that just became available for pre-order today. You know, there's there's all of this amazing merchandise, the Netflix prequel series. You know, he he kind of, um, you know, left this earth, unfortunately, you know, feeling like a, a disappointment, at least in this. I mean, obviously, you know, specifically to, to his fantasy films. Right. And um, it's just unfortunate. 
It, I mean, I, I do see, uh, some parallels with, with George Lucas, who we were talking about earlier, where I think, I think George Lucas in, in, in many similar ways feels or felt shackled to the, the Star Wars universe, the way Jim Henson felt shackled to the Muppets, which is not, which is not to say a father doesn't love his children, but you also say like, you know, there's, (laughs) there's also this other thing I want to be known for too, you know? Um, Right. Yeah. Uh, and mean, at least at least Jim Henson doesn't have like a Howard the Duck under his belt, you know. Like, this is least, true. <laughs> you know, George Lucas, um, you know, sowed a lot of wild oats, you know, cinematically, <laughs> and, and, and had some dubious. <laughs> you know, Howard the Duck. That's one of those things where I'm just like, what? Like, I want to know what he saw in his mind because I feel like I can't imagine that the movie that was made was what he set out to make. Listen, I hate to I hate to do like a shameless plug for myself, but I have to do it. I wrote um, last I think last year. Yes, that's uh, right. You did. History of Howard the Duck. That's right. Uh, and it's, where, it's, where, where it can was people read so that? amazing to go and interview these people to talk about Howard the Duck. It was so crazy. It's one of it's one of like my favorite things I've ever written. You know, and so um, go check it out. It's over at decider dot com. Sorry, I had to do that plug. But. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, what, what was the website again? It's uh, decider, decider dot com. Decider dot. I remember reading that. That's that's so funny. I I completely missed the thread. But yeah, you you wrote that, and it was great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was wacky. And Leah Thompson. I I just I love Leah Thompson. I obviously I was acquainted I, with her through Back to the Future. And oh, when that's I right. Called her up and said, "Hey, will you talk with me about Howard the Duck?" She was like, "Absolutely, I'll talk about Howard the Duck any day." I was like, "Great." <laughs> I just love it. that you can you can just call up Leah Thompson. I think I think that alone is like. Mad props. Let me tell you, like (laughs) my seven-year-old self can't believe she's in my cell phone. There's like, there's, you know, there's there's a heaven. I know there (laughs) is. But but so so get, getting back to the, to the Dark Crystal so 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 it you know you you mentioned Labyrinth and it's funny because a couple months ago I had uh, Terry Erdman and Paul Block on uh, to talk about their Labyrinth book also from Inside Editions and so we had a we had yeah a our books are like siblings or like cousins or something like that they're like really close relatives. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the, do you mean uh, uh, our books? Our books are like close relatives. Th- they are, yeah. They're like uh, kissing cousins, basically. <laughs> um, do, do you feel in your work and and in, in in the people you've talked to that Labyrinth was almost an apology for for the Dark Crystal? Well, maybe apology is the wrong word, but uh, a course correction. Yeah, that's actually the, the exact phrase I was going to use. Course correction. Yeah, it, it, clearly, clearly, you know. Um, the Muppet films, you know, if you think about the work of the Muppets, there were celebrity guests. There were none of that in The Dark Crystal. And so, you know, David Bowie was cast. And obviously before David Bowie was cast, there were a number of people being considered. I think Michael Jackson was also considered, right? Yeah. For, for Jared? That's right. Um, so, you know, that that was one course correction. There there was no music in The Dark, you know, no um you know, music with lyrics and in the Dark Crystal, you know, besides the score and things like that. Terrific um, score, by the way, Dark Crystal, Trevor Jones, fantastic score. Terrific score. And it just became available on iTunes, like, very recently. Oh, really? Just last month, I believe. So, yep. I'm going to download it right now. Check that out. Yep. And, um, so, you know, there was no music in the Dark Crystal, um, besides Terry Jones' brilliant score. And so there are songs in Labyrinth. Um, you know, there were no human characters in The Dark Crystal. And so I think Jim Henson was really trying to figure out, um, what, you know, why didn't Dark Crystal work? What, you know, what was it? And, um, you know, obviously fantasy films, you know, sold. You know, it wasn't that people didn't like fantasy films. People obviously enjoyed fantasy films. And so he tried to split the baby a little bit, you know, mm. on Labyrinth. And, um, you know, Labyrinth is closer to, even in terms of the um, the humor, you know, the, in the script, you know, bringing, um, you know, Terry Jones on board, you know, that's, right. that's closer, you know, it's, it's inching closer to the Muppets. Um, and, and, you know, the irony of it, of course, is that Labyrinth, you know, did significantly worse at the box office than the Dark Crystal did. So at that point, I mean, does he just throw his hands in the air like, guys, what do you want from me, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. And I think, you know, it was it was a real disappointment for him. You know, there's really no way to um, to mask it. You know, it was, it was really challenging, and he had obviously spent um, a lot of, you know, capital. You know, clearly Jim Henson, you know, at, at that point in his career was um, – 
you know, one, one bad movie was not going to tank his career. You know, I don't want to like speak ill of like Tim Burton or something like that, but right. you know, Tim Burton will always work. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, sure, sure. Um, you know, so, you know, Jim Henson, um, was never concerned about that. I think for him, it was really, um, the, it was really a lot of confusion. You know, I think he just genuinely didn't know what went wrong. And I think a lot of it comes down to timing, you know, um, which, which is in, in some ways I know sounds like a cheap excuse, but when you think about it, um, you know, the dark crystal came out the same year as ET. Yeah. I mean, that's just a juggernaut. You know, when, when dark crystal debuted, um, you know, ET was still in the top 10 and it was in its 28th week. You know, amazing. it was still, it was still doing phenomenally. You know, yeah. they, they, uh, ET, the, the week that dark crystal debuted, ET was trailing behind dark crystal by just about $2 million in terms of the weekend gross. I mean, wow. that's, that's, um, uh, that's tough, you know, and if you are, a parent and you're trying to decide what to take your kids to go see, um, you know, you had a lot of competition you that weekend. That that weekend you had a reissue of Peter Pan back in theaters. You also had um, Empire Strikes Back who was back in theaters that weekend, coincidentally. Hmm. Um, Dark Crystal and you also had E.T., you know, all all competing for the same space. I mean, it's, it's, it, to me, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you're just like, man, what an embarrassment of riches, you know, and you don't realize that, well, <laughs> at the moment, it's like cutthroat. Yeah. And I feel like there are lots of, um, there are lots of films, you know, um, that, that sort of have met that fate. L- luckily, when I spoke to the people about Howard the Duck, they didn't blame it on the release date, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think there, there, there were bigger problems. Know, um, <laughs> Yeah, but, but but again, um it's funny because if you look at like a film like Back to the Future, which we spoke about before, yeah. um, not on this podcast but you know previously, Back to the Future was that film that sucked the, all the air out of the room for for other movies, you know, back in 1985 and in a weird sort of way really, you know, was a rising tide that lifted the boat of Teen Wolf, which in any other world Teen Wolf like wouldn't have been a successful movie like in any other world, but because it came out so close to the release of back to the future, um, you know, Teen Wolf was an amazing success. So it's, it's hard choosing dates and, and, you know, it really matters. Well, I guess we can take some comfort in the fact that Teen Wolf two didn't play like back to the future two. So that was, <laughs> the universe was correcting yeah, itself. I, it, that see, I, as I said before, I know there's a heaven, and now I, I, it's confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> so, t- talk to me about your. Now, you said you you saw Dark Crystal as an adult. Yes. So that I'm I'm curious about it because I again I I was about I I saw if I remember correctly, I saw it 30 years ago. I saw it in 87. So I was like seven going on eight. Uh, so there's like, mm-hmm. I, and I haven't revisited the whole way through until just now, you know, before talking to you, but uh, I'll always have that sort of nostalgic affinity for it. What, what was your egress into the film as an adult? Yeah, my, um, it's interesting, you know, seeing a film like that, you know, a film that's made for kids, especially um, during the time when you were a kid, but seeing it as an adult for the first time, you know, it's kind of an odd experience. Right. Um, and I couldn't help but um, be overwhelmed the first time I saw it by how unique it was. You know, how I had gone so much of my life and literally never seen a film like The Dark Crystal. Um, you know, it, that, that to me was my major takeaway as an adult. Um, I love puppets. You know, I, I wrote a book on Pee Wee's Playhouse, as I mentioned before. I love Little Shop of Horrors. I wrote an oral history on Howard the Duck. I mean, that was, you know, not totally a puppet, but, right. um, you know, I, I love, um, I just love puppetry. There's something about it that just fascinates me. And I really miss, um, the 80s and that period of time where you had films like E.T., like Never Ending Story, like, um, you know, Star Wars and the Star Wars, the original trilogy, where, you know, there were these tactile characters. Um, it, you don't you don't have that now. I mean, you, you see that a little bit more with um, with the recent Star Wars films. But, sure. you know, you, you can imagine what Dark Crystal would look like if it were released like 15 years later, because you saw that in like the George Lucas prequels, you know. Right. Um, and and so all this is to say, I was amazed at 
Jim Henson and his team's ability to tell a complete story um, for over 90 minutes entirely with puppets. Like, as someone who geeks out about that sort of thing, like, I was just in awe of the filmmaking process of it. And, and to be honest with you, the first time I saw the movie, it was kind of hard for me to pay attention to the story, only because I was just fascinated by just, like, the spectacle of it. Right. Yeah, and, you know, you talk about it being self-contained. I think that in and of itself is fascinating, that that was the intent from the start, that when George, George sorry, George Lucas, when Jim Henson was asked about it, in contemporaneous interviews, he's like, it's self-contained. I don't see any sequels after this because it's, it's not meant to, to continue on. Can you imagine a filmmaker saying that today? That feels like, uh, you know, n- nowadays you say that after the fact, after your movie doesn't perform. Like, well, we never actually meant for there to be sequels, so it's fine. Right. It's heresy. It's like cinematic heresy to say that. Um, and, and what's funny to me about it is, you know, there's one of the things that I think you know, we all kind of take for granted a little bit is there are so few fantasy films that really come out of a filmmaker's imagination, you know, right. um, even something like never ending story, obviously is, is an adaptation of a book. Uh, little shop of horrors is an adaptation of, uh, you know, a, a musical. And then, you know, and then that adaptation was a, a adaptation of a film. Um, but you know, the fact that the dark crystal was designed to be a standalone film, as you said. Um, that was this super expansive and expensive yeah. <laughs> project. Um, you know, forget about whether or not a filmmaker would say we're only making one. Just think about a filmmaker committing that much of his or her life yeah. to a film that they only plan on making one of, you know? Right. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about the expense. It's very, you know, a, a quote that you have, for, you, you know, you quote Rex Reed's uh, review where he's like, I'm paraphrasing, but like, it's just obscene to spend this much money on a children's picture. And mm-hmm. and you say, well, geez, I mean, that's that's just the industry now. You right. Know, I mean, yeah, I, I, it'd be interesting to go back to Rex Reed and, and read that quote to him and, and see what he thinks about, you know, any of these Pixar films or just, I mean, frankly, any film, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, any of these films that have these expansive budgets, um, you know, does he still think it's obscene or, or does he think that Jim Henson was sort of, you know, cutting edge and ahead of the curve? I do find it. I mean, it's the 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 idea that for and and if we adjust for inflation, I mean, what would twenty six million be today? I mean, I I don't even know. I can do it. I can figure it out. Let's let's keep talking, and I'll get you an answer on that. Okay, <laughs> but but the 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 fact that however expensive that was, which I mean, yeah, that's that's a substantial amount of nineteen eighty two dollars. The fact that the budget was used to damn the film is mm-hmm. is you know we saw the same phenomenon with like titanic oh you made the most expensive movie ever made how do you justify that and it's like but you know this is before the film came out and we see that again and again and it's like well you should judge the movie based on what it is not what was spent on it yeah one of the things that i really kind of curtailed in the book and just so you know the the, the number for that is almost 67 million dollars okay so it's a, it's a considerable amount of money yeah <laughs> especially talking. when you're out of pocket on it Right. You know, and this is, there's, there's a great interview that you can find on YouTube, um, which I, I didn't, um, just because of space, not because of like, you know, any, any, you know, editorial reason or anything like that, but, Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't include it in the book, but, you know, Jim Henson and Frank Oz were very, very, very defensive. Um, at the time of the film's release. And the interview that I'm talking about, I think, is with Entertainment Tonight, where they're yes. asked about the budget. I, Frank I Oz just saw that. Out, yeah, Frank Oz goes, yeah, goes off on a little bit of a tirade about how they don't like to discuss money because once you discuss money, people do exactly what Rex Reed did, which is say, oh, well, then this better be worth it. Oh, right. well, this better be worth it. You know, um, it's funny because I used to work, this is such a non sequitur, but it's, it's relevant to what we're saying. <laughs> I used to work at a Sam Goody, and it's funny because I, you know, when I tell people I used to work in a music store, especially when they're like young people, they go, like, What's a music store? Yeah, what's a Sam but, Goody? Um, but I used to work at a Sam Goody for a very long time. And I remember in the waning days of Sam Goody, people would come in and say things like, You know, I'm not going to buy this CD, I'll just download it because, like, Beyonce doesn't need my money. And somehow, like, the the justification for piracy was sort of cloaked in 
your judgment as to whether or not the person whose artistry you enjoy does, you know, needs right. quote unquote your money. Are they, are they <laughs> independently wealthy enough for me to steal their music? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I think that that is funny the way that people sort of get like, you know, indignant about budgets and things like that. It's sort of a, a very odd, um, dance that and maybe we all do it. You know, I, you know, people will spend like, you know, uh, you know, $25 on a, a meal at Applebee's or something like that, but they won't spend $25 for like an album that they're going to listen to forever. It's like the strangest thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I guess it, it it's not an, it's not uh, a, a new or old phenomenon. It's just, I think par for the course when it comes to uh, critiquing uh, these, these mega budget productions that, well, it costs this much. It, it, it needs to measure up to uh, what I know you spent. It's not, you know, the, the, really the, the, what w- the, the budget of a film for a viewer is how much they paid for their ticket. Right, right, exactly. You know. And I think that's that was one of the, you know, again, that just goes back to um, the hurdle that Jim Henson had in promoting this film, you know, and, and I think one of his really clever workarounds for that was that he went on the road. You know, he was really one of the first filmmakers to go to fan conventions, to genre conventions, science fiction conventions, um, with his film and sort of give a preview and he had exhibitions throughout um, not just America, but throughout many locations in the world, um, bringing creatures from the dark crystal um, and props and artifacts and talking about world building. And, and now obviously something like San Diego or New York comic con, you know, everyone, everyone expects, you know, you had better be going with, um, you know, clips from the latest Star Wars movie or something like that. You know, now it's just to be expected. But Jim Henson was really sort of a pioneer in trying to break through some of that that chatter with going directly to people who would be um, the target audience for this film. And, and I can't say this definitively, but I would almost bet that the people that are the most ardent supporters of the Dark Crystal, um, especially those that have been on board for 35 years, are people who were genre fans, you know, more than they were Muppet fans, would be my guess. And I think that's because Jim Henson, um, you know, went there. Well, and, and, I mean, we we were talking a little bit about how there was no sequel intended. I was wondering if you could talk very briefly about the sequel that didn't happen. Um, which is the, yeah, so, the, um, so there was a, a sequel that was planned called The Dark Crystal 2, The Power of the Dark Crystal, and it was in production for, um, you know, for kind of close to forever, you know, if mm-hmm. you can measure like that unit of time. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was in production for um, a very long time, and, you know, well, you know, it's funny. I have to, I have to say, um, you know, I always I always say things in these interviews that make me go, "Oh, I hope I don't get myself in trouble," but I don't <laughs> think I will. Um, you know, the the reality is, I was a little bit um, I was a little bit nervous in the book about talking about the sequel that didn't materialize uh-huh. because I, you know, I while I think it makes for a very interesting reading, you know the book is an officially licensed book and, you know, you want to make sure that, that there are no hard feelings about projects that didn't come to term. Um, and I was so surprised when I started, you know, speaking with Cheryl and Lisa Henson um, about the sequel, how incredibly forthcoming they were about um, their love for the sequel, even though it, it didn't materialize. And, and I actually had um, the amazing pleasure of going to the, um, the Muppet Workshop in uh, Astoria in New York. Uh-huh. And they, they had so, um, they have so many materials, um, so many production materials and sketches and renderings and concept art for the power of the dark crystal, the sequel that didn't materialize. Um, it made my head spin. You know, we, we got some of it in the book, but there is so much more, you know, now I'm doing like almost like a humble brag sort of thing, but there's so <laughs> much more that like isn't in the book and that people haven't seen that was just beautiful, beautiful art. And I'm, I'm hopeful that some of those ideas and some of that concept art that I saw, especially that was just, um, really striking imagery um, will find its way into the Netflix prequel series, you know, yeah. obviously in a repurposed fashion, but um, 
but it was it was great, and, and you know that that was a sequel that has since come out now in uh, a comic book series. So that same basic story, which um, is written by David O'Dell, who wrote the screenplay, um, he didn't he wrote the story. He didn't write the actual text to the comic book, but um, but. David O'Dell wrote the screenplay for the sequel, which was then adapted into this comic book series, which is currently um, ongoing. And according to David O'Dell, um, he and Jim Henson were kind of like spitballing, like, what if we did a sequel? Like, what if? You know, how could we do it if we were to do it? And this is, um, you know, a version of the, of the story that, you know, he and Jim spitballed back in, in the early 80s, you know, just hypothetically if they were to do a sequel. And who knows? Maybe if if the the Netflix uh, series ends up uh, doing well, the, these ideas could uh, materialize in sequel form. Uh, you know, anything's possible. I hope so. And you know, what's, what's been great to see about the Dark Crystal is the way in which the Jim Henson Company has expanded this universe. You know, again, as you said, this is a standalone film. This isn't really a franchise, but they've been able to explore this world and really develop it into a franchise because the characters and the um, the mythology of the world of Thra is, is so rich that, that Jim and really Brian Proud um, developed you know, it's it's a, a world that's sort of ripe for mining, and, and they're mining it, and I'm happy that they are. Well, and and with that in mind, I mean, is there anything else uh, in the in the book that you'd like to get the word out about that maybe we didn't allude to in our conversation here? Sure. Yeah. The 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 one big thing that I that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is there are like a million pictures in the book. <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's gorgeous. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's funny because I have such, like, um, an interesting relationship to these books that I, I write because, you know, obviously I approach them first as um, – I don't want to say I approach them first as a fan, but, I, but obviously I'm, I'm interested in them as a fan, you know, and, and I'm interested in them as, like, a journalist. But um, I, I really – geek out when I, you know, when we're selecting pictures and when, you know, <laughs> when the layout is being done and we're writing captions and things like that. And um, when I received the book, I just, um, I, I just felt like, you know, Inside Editions does such beautiful, beautiful books. And I love their Labyrinth book. I love, you know, their Ghostbusters book. I love, you know, they've done so many amazing books um, that I've had on my bookshelf, truth be told, before working on the Dark Crystal book. This isn't like me just like, you know, plugging Inside Editions because, <laughs> uh, because they're releasing the old and visual history. They just do great, great, great work. And, um, but, you know, I know I'm a little bit biased, but I feel like the Dark Crystal one is like my favorite of all of, them, <laughs> all of their books. But um, again, no bias. Of, <laughs> no bias, no bias. But it just in terms of like the pictures and the layout and just the, um, you know, the, the Dark Crystal, there's a, there is a lot of material out there. You know, Brian Froud wrote an amazing book called The World of the Dark Crystal, um, which has been reissued. You know, there's, you know, Diehard fans have have been able to find a lot of material um, over the the course of the last 35 years, and the Internet has obviously only accelerated that. And I can't wait for people to see the book because there are things in in the book that are truly – being seen for the first time. And so, you know, even if you're like a fan that feels like you've seen it all, you know, um, this, this is, it, some things are going to blow your mind. And so I'm really excited about that. Well, like I said, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic book and, and for anyone who loves the art of filmmaking, uh, I, I think there's a lot to learn, even if you don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of, of the universe of, of the dark crystal, I think there, there's a lot to love. So I'm just going to echo what you've said about, about inside editions in their books, because like you, I've got a whole section of, of their, their books just, just on my shelf. I'm looking at it right now as I'm talking to you and uh, they, they do good stuff. They know what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, um, it's great, and it, it's great to be able to tell these stories of, um, you know, it, it's funny because I think when you write about films sometimes, and I don't know if you feel this way with the podcast, now I'm going to start to interview you. No, <laughs> I, uh, but, you know, I don't know if you feel this way with the podcast, but I feel like sometimes when you tell people, you know, what you do and what you work on, they kind of go like, oh, so you write about, like, movies? Like, that's, <laughs> you know, that's not like real writing, you know, it's right. not like real interviewing. Um, but, you know, I think um, 
what you and I both understand and certainly what Insight understands, and, and every publisher that I've worked with has understood this, is that, you know, these these movies are our shared history and, and to preserve it um, in a way that is worthy of, you know, any other work of art is um, is really important. And I, you know, and, and it's, again, I don't, I don't want to get corny, but it's, a, it's something that I really am aware of. You know, that's why I try and interview as many people as possible. I try and be as accurate as I can be. I, you know, I fact check everything. I have people go over it, you know, um, the back to the future book that I wrote, I had, um, Bob Gale, it was actually over the Christmas holiday. So I'm getting like these like daily emails from Bob Gale with like, you know, you know, <laughs> little, you know, you, you got this a little bit wrong. You got this really right. How did you know that? You know, all of these little like tweaks to make the story better. Wow. Um, and it's great. And I, I just, um, I, I have this wonderful fantasy of like all of these books, not just the ones that I wrote, but all the books that Insight has done, all of these pop culture books, like, you know, being buried in like a time capsule and like, you know, a thousand years from now, people will know, um, you know, what we were like. Is that so corny? And is I, that corny to say? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is. I mean, I mean, to, just to echo your point, I mean, that was a big reason why I started, started the Nostalgia Theater show was exactly that reason, because I want to have these in-depth discussions uh, about these artifacts and re- ideally talk to, you know, you know, people like you who are creating these documents or pe- the people who are involved in the case of, you know, I've spoken with Brandon Braga and Patrick Duffy in previous episodes where, you know, really let's let's preserve these as as long form conversations about the entire process as opposed to sort of the the snippets and sound bites that we end up with, uh, you know, out of necessity. And I think it's important to go back um, and and do this in an archival sort of way. And then what I mean is, you know, <clears throat> it's one thing to get a bunch of interviews with people who are trying to sell a film, That's you know, exactly like a right. press junket or something like that. But, you know, once, once you put some distance between um, the product and, um, you know, the, the, the retrospective, I find that you get a, a very different story from a lot of people. Oh, and so, um, that, that to me is, is interesting. And that's what I always say when people, um, you know, like the most annoying kind of review I, I ever read is like the people that say like, oh, well, you can go on Wikipedia and you can get this information for free. It's like, well, you, you can't really because, you know, what, what Wikipedia, what a lot of Wikipedia is, is sort of like culled from interviews of the day, not interviews that are sort of retrospective where people are, um, really going more in depth and having these more long form conversations yeah. and being able to sort of archive this history and preserve it in um in a way that's worthy of the things that we're preserving. You right. know, and that's why I, I love I love, love, love doing this. I love it. It's it's um it's such an amazing gift to be able to do this. I grew up reading pop culture books like a complete nerd loser back in elementary <laughs> school. I walked around. I'm not kidding. In my book bag, I walked around with a copy of Mark Scott Decree's The Twilight Zone Companion, and I walked around with a copy of Leonard Maltin and Richard W. Band's book on Our Gang. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the and, um, and I would just read them from cover to cover. And, 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 uh, and also... Um, uh, the uh, the Wizard of Oz book, um, Fricky's uh, Wizard of Oz book, and you know I would just read these things and learn about filmmaking, and and I was always amazed at how much went into um, you know an hour and a half, two hour film. You know that you could have so many people and so much money and so much energy and so much creativity and so many things that um, were left on the cutting room floor, and and I was always fascinated that. Um, there were things that were viewed as being so disposable by so many people, but meant so much um, to everyone. Right. You know, how could you view something as disposable that's been with you your entire life? Um, so, so for me, it's really important to be able to do this, and I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to. Well, and and I want to thank you so much for talking. I I, I think uh, based on the books you're describing, carrying around, if had we gone to school at the same time, we probably would have been buddies. I have a feeling. I have a feeling we would have definitely. <laughs> you know, I, both have cool names. Too. That's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I remember being in second or third grade and and uh, checking out you know the making of King Kong the 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 1976 mm-hmm. King Kong and and uh, you just sort of you know inhaling that stuff you know so uh, I'm I'm very much in the same boat as you. 
I love it. See, we're important people. Let's keep doing this. <laughs> let's, let's, well, I, you know what? I, that's a perfect segue into me saying I expect you to come back and talk to me the next time you have a book to, to talk up. That is my promise. I absolutely will. Well, that, that's you. You heard it, folks. I've got I've got all of you as witnesses. And and Kathleen, it was absolutely a pleasure to talk with you again. I'm glad we had uh, the full hour to really unpack uh, this this terrific book and this terrific film. So thanks so much for doing that. Thank you, Zachy. I appreciate it. And very quickly, before I let you go, if people are looking to seek you out online after hearing you here, uh, I know that you have uh, many homes on the interwebs. Uh, where can people find you? Yes, I'm on um, all social media at Kasim Gaines. That's C-A-S-E-E-N-G-A-I-N-E-S. Um, and by all social media, I mean all social media for like a guy like me, which is like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, beyond that, you you have to, and, and maybe LinkedIn, but who does that? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And and as for me, folks, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Zaki's Corner. That's Z-A-K-I-S Corner. You can also find me at the Huffington Post where my movie reviews go up regularly, as does this show, as does the movie film show. And, of course, my website is Zaki'sCorner.com. And as I tell you each and every episode, please go to iTunes and leave a review, leave a star rating, let people know what you think of the show, what you think of the topics we are covering and what kind of guests you would like to have us speak with in the future i want to thank my guest kasim Gaines, for talking to me you can look for his book the dark crystal the ultimate visual history in store september 19th and you can watch the dark crystal on home video or anywhere right now because it's 35 years old and uh, you can find me back in the next episode of nostalgia theater very soon thanks everybody for listening